was good, Ed. All right, John. Thank you for so much for coming on the Inner Edison podcast. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, Ed. I'm a fan of the show. I've learned a lot. I enjoy your broadcast. Uh, you've got great guests, so it's an honor to be one of them. Well, thank you. Uh, I've been doing it for a couple of years. I just, I want to, I just, I enjoy talking to people. That's really yeah. what it is. I, I'm a communicate. I like to have that conversation. You know. Oh, I can tell. I can tell, and you're good at it. You're, you're you've got a gift. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, I enjoy your shows. You've, uh, thank you. well, I've learned a lot. Good. Yeah. All right. So this is about you, not me, because this is, my, yeah, it's my show, but it's all about the guests. And I'm amazed how many people don't really, you know, they're like, wow, you actually listen to what I say. It's like, that's what hosts are supposed to do. <laughs> right. And, and when you hear something uh, you want to, and you let the guests finish, but then you go back to that thing that you wanted to talk about, not just stay in one place. And we, before the, our mics went live and everything, we were talking a little bit and you were talking about how, um, you were a youth who got in trouble a little bit a lot yeah i did uh i don't know why just of my nature i guess but you know being the oldest boy you want to push the boundaries a little bit and you get in with the wrong crowd and there was times we always seemed to know when to stop before we got into too much trouble uh but we did a lot of crazy stuff like most people did in the day i mean i don't know too many people that didn't but i did get into uh i did two years of college in illinois and then I wanted to be an accountant. So I transferred to Charlotte where they had a really good accounting program. I took a year off and I started working in a restaurant and I met a guy there who was a pretty big time drug dealer and he was making a lot of money. He had it all figured out. I was 21 years old and I started selling marijuana in the restaurant, a little here, a little there, you know, and it became more and more regular, got my little regular customer base. And then one day the guy that we were buying from came up and said, Hey, uh, you guys want to buy a whole pound? We're like, whoa, that's a lot of that's a lot of weed. Um, don't want to be caught with it, but we decided to do it. If if I could find a guy that would buy half a pound, and I found a guy in the restaurant, he said he'd buy half of it. Um, so I brought it to work, put it in the trunk of my car. I gave him the keys. He wanted to inspect it first, and uh, he goes out to take a look at what we've got. What I didn't know was my partner in crime had taken all the buds out, all the really good buds, and so it was a lot of shaking. And the guy came back and said, "I'm not buying that." And I said, well, you know, what do I do now? You know, we were pretty much counting on this money to pay for the pound. Well, anyway, I'm figuring that out. And we have a meeting, unannounced meeting at work. And the guy who manages the restaurant calls us all in. He says, I realize we've got a major drug problem going on at this restaurant. He had two uniformed police officers standing there. He said, I know who did it. And we're going we're gonna to solve this tonight. And 21 years old, you're starting to think, okay, they got me. They know. And so you're thinking, well, all these things that are about to happen, that you can't stop. Uh, for instance, you know, college is probably out of the question. This is going to be a prison sentence for sure. I got about $500 to my name. I can't even fight this thing. They got me dead to rights anyway. So public defender at the time in North Carolina, uh, it's about a two year sentence if you're caught with that much marijuana. So I'm waiting for them to put the cuffs on me. They never did. Um, I walked out to the car that night and I'm thinking they're waiting for me to get in the car so they can arrest me. They didn't. Okay. They're waiting for me to get home so they can arrest me. They didn't. It never happened. And so that was it. That was my big scare moment where I told the guy that I was working with, I'm out. I'll never do this again. This is crazy to take this kind of risk for just a little bit of money. But you don't know that at 21, right? right. So I got lucky. I got lucky there. Did they arrest anybody? No. I think, honestly, the guy there, I think, honestly, he was just trying to scare me. He knew the road I was going down, and he was trying to stop me. I think it was just a, an act of grace personally and it worked but he knew who it was you sure he, he knew who it was uh maybe he was just smoking us out but it was an awful right. big I'm, I'm thinking he's just like <laughs> let's see who sweats you know maybe you're right maybe you're right let's uh, see who doesn't show up tomorrow <laughs> right. putting everybody on notice we have no idea who it is <laughs> yeah. we're putting and now that stuff's legal everywhere right Forget it's that. no big deal right yeah. they let everybody out and and that's well, like in new york um, they were giving priority to people who were put into prisons because of marijuana to get the marijuana stores first. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Cause yeah. one of the guys he does the, um, he spoke at one of the events I was at and he does this, uh, con not convict. I forget what it's con con. It's, it's a workout for, that he is. He created while he was in prison yep. and he created all these little, you know, uh, knockoff, you know, workout centers. And he was going to con body. I think that's con body. I, I used yeah. him to teach when I was teaching in prison. I actually used yeah. his example. Yeah. So pretty cool. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that he was like, yeah, so now I'm getting back into it after that's what sent me to jail. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Makes sense. Right. Everything comes full circle, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, 
So yeah, you know, people use it. So let's just move yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. So All right. That so was, that scared you. Absolutely. And then what did you straight. do after that? Well, I decided, okay, I'm going to go back to college and finish this thing. I'm going to get the accounting degree. I wanted to be a CPA. Play it safe. Be a CPA. I thought I could, you know, be a great accountant. And at the school that I had transferred and taken a whole year off to go to, they had like a 300 level washout class. I took it. I got an F. I mean, a hard F. I mean, I got like 40%. And uh, I had never failed a class in my life. Uh, so it was a wake up call. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to take it again. And I'm just going to focus more and, and give this top priority. Got another F. <laughs> and I realized this isn't going to happen. I just, I can't do the work. I don't know. There's something about this work that doesn't fit me. So I had to make change, but you know what you learn. I mean, that's a, a, probably one of the biggest failures at the time. What you learn is I'd have been a terrible accountant. So mm -hmm. it was a blessing in disguise. It's like your, the, your premise, you know, I've got a failure here. What do I do with it now? Well, it just so happened that I finished up, just got a business degree. And my dad had worked for a company for 50 years, started as, in the factory and he worked his way up to national sales manager. Took him, you know, 25, 30 years. He's in his mid-50s now. And one day they let him and all his buddies go, you know, because it's like, hey, we can get 225s for this 50, same price, uh, like a lot of companies do. So he he was pissed. I mean, he built this company up his whole life, sacrificed quite a bit. And he said, I will never do that again. I will never work for anybody else again. So I'm going to start my own company doing what I've always done in the place I've always done it. And he had did it for about a year. He was working out of the dining room. He had no money, you know, one typewriter, one phone and a filing kind of, that's the whole business. But he invited me to come work for him. And I thought, wow, this is the riskiest thing I could possibly do here. All my buddies are going to get out of college, go to work for big firms, get a big head start on me. I'm going to be in the dining room here. When this thing goes south, whoa, what do I have to show for it? Right. So I told him, I said, I'll give you two years because I can learn from you. I know I can learn a lot. You've been in this industry your whole life, but I'm going to get out and go somewhere safe after that. What he knew was putting your fate in somebody else's hand is the risk. You just don't see it until you get into it. So that was 1987. And I, this company I'm in tonight is that same company that uh, is still functioning very well. We did uh, $5 million in sales last year. We own the building we, we work from. We've got seven employees. I mean, it was a struggle, of course. But, you know, my second biggest mistake that didn't happen was I didn't say I can't do this because it's too risky. It would have changed the trajectory of my life in a much worse place. So, what is the business? Uh, we sell lockers, metal lockers. It's Lockers Unlimited out of Charlotte. Um, for like my dad's in the schools and the, yeah, and the yeah. yeah, all this stuff. All right. Everybody have one in high school. They don't even put them in high schools anymore. You know, people, kids don't have books. Oh, I was going to say, I've seen lockers <laughs> at this, at our college, I mean, our high schools here. The older ones, but the new ones they're building now, they don't usually bother. Some do. But, but not like they used to. That used to be the big customer. Well, anyway, me and him are in the dining room working. There's a, a, I'm going to go right down the line of my mistakes that I learned from. And I set up a little manual accounting system. Now, bear in mind, I'm an accounting flunky. But I was trying to keep the numbers straight because I knew you had to have records. And we got to the point one year where we were just struggling. I mean, I was putting things in convenience stores on consignment. And, you know, I had a route where I was putting glare screens out for consignment, you know, doing door-to-door -door selling, trying to get something because we didn't have enough money coming in. Um, and we just didn't have time to do the record keeping. And we got to the end of the year, the account of one of the numbers. And I said, Man, what do you want to do? We don't have anything. He said, just put 10% on last year's numbers. That'll be fine. So I did that. And uh, I said, well, what if we're audited? We can't back up any of these numbers. Don't worry about it. So of course we're audited, right? The next thing that happens and it got ugly because they're looking at our bank deposits and they're looking at what we reported. They're totally two different numbers. We can't explain where the money went. And they think we're, we're siphoning money and it was going to get ugly. Um, we about, they were going to call in the IRS, which would have been real trouble. Um, but by the grace of God, again, I went to the lady who, cause this was just a sales tax audit to start. And I said, look, oh, they're the worst. Mistake. They're yeah. the worst. And they ground you through the mud. Oh my God. Uh, I, I just, <laughs> I helped somebody with a loan recently and they closed their company up and started a new one because they kept auditing the sales tax and they were, and there was nothing wrong, but that's just the amount of work that was involved. Their attorney goes, just do this. Yeah. yeah. Well, once you're on the list, you're on the list and they keep coming back. I mean, that's what they did for us. So we, that's, well, exactly that's how the we, IRS is too. You know, yep. they go after oh, the yeah. small guy because you can't fight them. You don't have accountants. Right. You don't have attorneys. So yeah. You just roll over and, and write the check. Um, so that's exactly what we did. I told him if we can drop this now, We'll stop and start over. So we 
this was 1992. We've only been doing it about five years. And uh, we started the company over, but this time the books were going to be correct. I mean, I learned from that mistake. Uh, and it didn't kill us again. Once again, I got lucky and nobody went to prison. Uh, but we started it and we started it the right way. And when we did that, my dad said, you know what? I'm just going to let you run this. I think I've had enough of this. He didn't. The audit was pretty terrifying for him, I think. So then it became my company, 100%, um, which was pretty good at that young age. So again, you know, when you see that the, the mistake becomes a positive, if you play it right. And if you, uh -huh. you do have to get some luck, too. And it's, it's very true. I mean, I haven't met too many successful people who are just naturally successful, even if they say they are. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. No, it's, fi it's 15 years of overnight success. <laughs> Yes, exactly right. And I mean, a that's lot like of my, my biggest one I always talk about is Brian Smith from Ugg Fountain, who brought Ugg to America, how he lost his company during the process. I interviewed him the first year I was doing this, and I remember talking to him at an event where he was talking about it, and he started crying about it. But he basically, you know, he the way he set everything up, and then he actually they took the company from him, and he had to work to get it back. So, Jeez. Yeah. you, you got to want it, man. I mean, you really got to want it, and... Well, his wife told him to get his ass off the floor because he should stop being a whiner. I forget exactly what she said. Figure it out. That's yeah. a good partner there that yeah. did that for him. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and Because you got to learn. I mean, we all make these mistakes because all these mistakes happen. I mean, I even recently, my bookkeeper screwed up totally. And, it, and I'm like, and it's coming back to bite me. And it's like, what? I didn't, you know, you never. It's so hard to have that we rely on people to do the job that they say they're going to do. Yes, we can we trust and then yes we do try to verify but you don't always can verify everything so. you can't now especially when you get some size i mean you've got to trust somebody sometime you can't do it all yourself um we hit a, a a rough patch there where i was sure we were going out of business they had changed they had set up a guy and he's he was going to underbid me we're doing construction he's coming in really really low on these bids bidding the same product and my customers that i built up over probably 10 years by this time are coming to me and saying hey the contractor showed me the number. It's better than the number you're giving me. How can this possibly be for the exact same thing? So I figured we're done. There's no way I can fight this. Um, and I decided I was going to bring in a broker. We're going to sell the company. I'm going to get something out of it. Here's another mistake. I made a huge mistake. And, and this is probably the number one mistake businesses make in, in a growth phase. You have a good year, maybe you have two good years and you think, well, it's, it's on a, only upward from here. All right. So now I'm going to go hire a bunch of people. I'm going to get everybody a company car, get everybody a cell phone, you know, and then we hit a bump in the road and the overhead's too high and it's over. You know, I've seen that happen numerous times. I was dumb enough to sign a five-year lease on a 10,000 square foot building based on, you know, a, a good year, or maybe a good year and a half. Cause I figured, ah, oh, we got it figured out now. Nothing, nothing can go wrong. And then September 11th went wrong and we had a Y2K problem right before that. And then this guy came in and started screwing up my distribution channel. And I went to my partner he, I gave him 20% ownership. He was my installer, my best friend from eighth grade. And I said, I'm selling the company. This is over. I can't even make this rent payment anymore. And they're going to take my house. You know, I got three more years of lease that I can't afford. And it was just like your partner. He said, hey, man, why don't you quit crying and go do what you're good at and go get some more customers? And I'm not quitting. And I said, no, you don't understand. I mean, we got about two more months before I'm going to have to liquidate. And he said, well, I'm not quitting. You know, and I said, okay, if you want to go down in flames together, I'll do it. Cause you know, best friends from eighth grade, let's just wipe it out. And I tell you the day I made that decision to stay and fight was the day things did turn around. And all of a sudden this guy drops out of the distribution channel. Our numbers are better than they've ever been. And you think back to, boy, that would have been a terrible mistake to make, to not believe that I could do it, you know, to not believe in myself that I could do it. Uh, so that was uh, probably the big one, you know, and once I, got there, I realized that it's all about not quitting, really. If you want to be successful, it's all about just staying in the game and making changes and moves until you figure a way out. And if you do that, you can usually make it. I mean, I don't know too many people that didn't have that moment where they were sure they were in trouble. I've had many of them. Yeah. But same here. Same <laughs> and my problem time. is it's not what I've done. Like, you know, recently we've had, we went, interest rates went up 5%, destroyed our, you know, the we're down oh, to 35% existing home sales and nothing else. And, you know, all because someone didn't like the administration, what they did. So they had to change all this stupid shit to cause inflation. I tell you, and it's noble work you're doing, man, because I, in the classes I teach, I try to steer people. We're dealing with the same demographic. You know, let's try to buy that first house. Now, if you can get a VA loan, you're, you're pretty good shape, right? I mean, they, they'll, they'll help you. But if you don't have a VA loan these days, stay in time. 
just the down payment you're going to need wipes out almost everybody. 3%? Yeah, 3% on, you know, now the median house, I don't know, here in Charlotte's, you know, $400,000. Right. Well, so that's I don't know, it's 3% 12 grand. is 12 grand. Yeah. I mean, I don't know too many guys that, that are in the place these guys are that could even fathom 12 grand. They can't fathom 1200. Sure. Do you have like, so there is another program. This I don't want to get into the real estate right, right. part of it for you, but USDA, which right. is for rural, which is 100% financing. Yeah. And they got programs here. And I try to get these guys that if you'll move into a, what they call a, not a bad neighborhood, but you know, a marginal neighborhood mm -hmm. and you're a policeman or you're a fireman or you're an emergency mm -hmm. worker, they'll, they'll basically help you buy that house for almost nothing down. I mean, and you can you gotta live there. there. You got to live there. They want you there. Yeah. Uh, no rent, if you no need a book, I got, I wrote the book, financial freedom, building personal wealth or home ownership. I can ship you some books if you want it for your class. I'll buy them. I you know I definitely will because I don't yeah. need you to buy them. No. Uh, well, I'm happy to the, uh, did I, I can author copies, a couple bucks, not a big yeah. deal. Okay. Well, they, there's the guy not that, that I'm going to get business from because I don't, I'm not licensed in sh North Carolina. Right. 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 And right. I'm just giving them because my whole purpose of my book was to get education out to help people understand the buying process and how easy it really is. But you're right. So what you do is you, you find somebody else to go in with you and until you can buy them out, you share the equity. Yeah. I mean, it's like running a business. When you hit a bump, you find a way. Yeah. There's ways. You just got to keep at it until you get there. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a good tax refund one year is enough to buy for most people. It should be. Yeah. It yeah. should be. If you play your cards right. And then well, if yeah, you what, um, claim enough to where they take, you know, not, you know, don't claim enough. So they take more money from you out of your paychecks. And then at the end of the year you go, Oh, look, I, I didn't claim here's 12 grand. Well, there's your down payment. Cause you can't save it anyway. There's one way to save it. I'll tell you what, when, uh, when I was teaching in prison, they had a work release program. And that basically was, you get to go work third shift in a factory somewhere for $12 an hour, you know, but it's the best day of your life in prison when they let you out the gates and you could work and you, now you're making money. Well, you couldn't get to much of it. They would hold it for you until you got out. And you got guys walking out the gate with $20,000. They don't know anything about money. And they go buy a BMW with it or something crazy. <laughs> I'm saying That's like the ball players do when exactly. they first get their first check. Oh my yeah. God. We can't afford the insurance. You know, I don't, I don't know what I'll do about that, but man, it's a sweet car. So, so you, don't, you don't teach at the prison anymore. No, we, we hit a crossroads there. Uh, COVID would have wiped me out anyway, but I was getting too, they don't like you getting too friendly. You know, they've got stri very strict rules. And I was getting way too friendly with these guys. Cause I could really see a lot of potential that was going to go to waste if somebody didn't give them a little steering in the right direction. They just were never taught. I mean, they were smart people. A lot of them had run businesses, illegal businesses, but they had run businesses. They had business sense, but they didn't know how to play the game with within the rules. Um, and my advice was always, you know, go to real estate, take that and put a down payment on something, find a place that you can fix up, you know, and rent out or live in it or whatever, but get your toe into some real estate here. And now you've got some equity, right? You can borrow against mm -hmm. this thing. You can do a lot with this, but you know, don't don't go buy a non-asset. And what a lot of guys would do is get out and throw a big party, you know, and and live it up for six months because they had all this money, and then they're right back to flat broke. And then they would go out and do whatever they did to get in the prison the first time. It was a horrible cycle because they didn't understand that this money could change their lives if it was used correctly. So, I mean, if I were to go back, I wouldn't. I love teaching entrepreneurship more than anything. But money management is what the prison system needs because the, the guys in there just they weren't ever taught. They didn't come from a place where that was ever taught. They didn't have a good role model. You know, and if you don't have that, you, you couldn't possibly learn it. You know, I guess when, you learned a book. Yeah, well, you need to go and they need to start at schools. So the problem is high school doesn't have anything. Now. Yeah, exactly. You know, they used to have years. You know, I, I think you used to call it home ec. Um, yeah. And I was telling somebody else, they're like, that's home ec. I go, well, I, I did wood shop and, you know, auto mechanics and right. welding. I did all the, you know, stuff and I didn't go to home ec. But, you know, and I didn't know about my parents owned two houses over my time, you know, and but we came back to California and they couldn't afford so they right. couldn't afford to buy. So you rent it, right? I mean, you have no other choice, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 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 That was but the sad part was that was back in the early 80s. Imagine. Know, almost late in the 70s that they were, you know, couldn't afford a California. And so I'm trying to explain to people, it doesn't matter whether it's 2024 or whether it's 1970s. You come from other states to California, you can't afford to own the homes unless you're making good money. Period. Well, real real money, yeah, these days. 
Yeah, yeah. we need 115,000 for a $400,000 house now. Is that what it is? Yeah. Wow. And not, I mean, how do you get, I mean, most people don't walk out the door with that. Of course, if you sell something, but like I say, if you sell something. I'm in, talking about that's how much you have to make. Yeah, I could yeah. see that. Yeah. And so yeah. I tell most people, um, get in the trades now. Trades are hurting big time everywhere. They need them and they'll pay amazing. If you're female, especially they'll pay even more to get, try. There's, they'll do female training to train you all the trades because they want to get women in trades. So that's Colorado, I'm sorry, California, Texas, Florida, everywhere that's growing, they need trades badly. Yeah. So. Oh, man. And I was dealing with guys that had a felony, obviously. Uh, my big hit was, you know, go work for a trucking company. The, a lot of them, if you agree to work on the dock for six months, they will pay for you to go to driving school. Then you got to drive for them for a couple of years. But after that, you save your money. You can buy your own rig. You got your own business, right? You can do your own hauls. You can do your own loads. And you can make... 150,000, 200,000 a year, pretty easy if you if you don't mind you know driving all the time. Yeah, but that's the only problem. You gotta drive all the time. Yeah, I mean, if if yeah. you're into that, it's a hard just, that's a hard <laughs> job, man. It is hard. I don't know how you do it. And traffic I drive like, now just some places. And you know, when I was younger, I could drive for hours and hours and hours and hours, no big deal. Now it's like I need a nap. It's it's, oh, it's, it's been 20 minutes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I know, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. We're stopping at every rest stop if we go somewhere. Yeah. You know, just to what about your time? Bit. I don't care about my time. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I'm my yeah. back hurts. <laughs> yeah, that was a long time ago. I yeah. got there in this amount of time. I still speed because that's just how it is. But you, you know, you have to, right? I mean, you got to keep up with the guy in front of you. That's that's the rule. Well, I just uh, you know, with ways and the different technologies today, there's a police officer ahead. Oh, thank you so much. We don't oh, have yeah. to rely on the CB ba as back in the day. Very true. It's all different, and it seems like since COVID. The driving has become much more aggressive, at least here. I don't know if it's a true. horrible driving. They're just, they don't stop at stop signs or they run lights. They stay in the middle of the lane. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. Swerving, going as fast as you can tailgating. It's, it's dangerous. I, I don't know if it's just me getting older or if it's, it's that both. way everywhere. Yeah, probably. It's, it's, it's that way everywhere, but it's, we're getting older and it's just no one. They're all important about themselves now versus oh, yeah. how it used to be, you know, and that's the difference. They don't care that they might hit a car with kids in it. Doesn't matter. So I see life was that lifeline behind you or life. Yeah. Lifeline education connection. Um, name of my books, lifeline to a soul. And I titled it that it took me three years to write. And I couldn't get the title. Couldn't get the title. Um, but somebody asked me one time, what's it like to teach in a prison? Well, you know, what's it, I've never been in a prison. What's it like? And uh, I told him, here's the thing. It's you got a, a room full of drowning men that are caught up in this recidivism cycle. They're going to come back and come back and come back. Um, so you're trying to throw a lifeline out there and, and you're hoping to pull this drowning man to shore, the problem I got is he doesn't know he's drowning. This is his normal. He thinks it's great. You know, this is fun for him. You know, he's got a pretty easy life. He, you know, they feed him. He's got clothes. He can play basketball, go work at night, make some money. Then he can come back and, you know, uh, do it again, go out with, with his check and have a big time. So the lifeline part was just about trying to pull people in out of a bad situation. And it wasn't everybody. Some guys really did not want to come back to prison. Uh, and, and so when, when my job ended, uh, I found another guy who actually was in the camp at the time and made him formed a education company who we basically are dealing with people now that have recently released or are overcoming obstacles. And it's the same format where we're teaching, you know, financial management and entrepreneurship, because, you know, once you've got that on your record, if you start your own company, your background kind of goes away. You know, you don't ask the guy who's doing your yardscape if he's ever been to prison, you know, it just doesn't come up. So starting your own business is a good way to make that felony erase, you know, where, whereas if you go apply for a job and they see a felony, you're, you're, you're very limited. Well, I knew a guy who had a felony and he was able to get his real estate license, which is unusual. It, it depends on what you got your felony for. If you for were drug, it was for drugs. Yeah, if yeah. you were embezzling money, they probably wouldn't let you be a lawyer, but you know <laughs> well you're so then there's the problem you're supposed to learn from your mistakes right exactly so they should allow you to do what you you know i yeah. could see if you were embezzling not being able to be a stockbroker or you know those kind of things or people handling people's funds for a while you know yeah right and they got a lot of rules uh yeah. so yeah you see where the felonies are limiting people and, and this is an avenue where if you really want it uh you could start something and and you could bring you know your family into it and, and build something or you're back at that factory. And in many cases, there's just not that many openings uh, for people with felonies. You know, they don't even consider you. 
right. Well, there's too many right now. They need everybody. Yeah, so true. They might do it now. Yeah. It's probably different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, they can't. Yeah. These days, you can't even get asked about anything. What's your age? You're, what? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's changed it's, a lot, hasn't it? Oh, it's huge. I mean, yeah. and I'm in the worst place for employers, which is California, because it's all it's an employee state. Oh, I can't even imagine there. I mean, North Carolina, we we still run it kind of the old way, where it, they make you check a box on the application. Do you have a felony? They're trying to get rid of that, but you know those those usually go right in the trash. Uh, really? Yeah. And yeah the, now they're making the it with. The, yeah, you have to yeah. check the box. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's, well, I'm just saying here, though, it's employee state to where employers don't have the rights the employees have the right so we have to and one of the things first thing is you are an employee first period don't care if you say you're an independent contractor or what you're an employee unless you can prove it otherwise brilliant yeah so they start so, with employee yes and then wow and that's a big and you have difference. to go away from the other yeah and so what we've had to do in our industry the mortgage industry you're the, they went where you have to be w 2 and you have to be, you know, minimum wage plus commission. So a lot of places, you know, that just kills you. Well, what we have done is everybody's got an independent there. I've um, got corporations now, LLCs, and we pay their LLC. And that's it. When you make the rules where they don't function anymore, you've, you've got to find a way around it just to yeah. operate. Right. I mean, well, see, real estate agents still are paid like independent contractors, period. It's like, why are they, but not, you know, us mortgage people? Cause it's the same thing. So. Yeah, you're doing the exact same thing. That's true. It's kind of a one hit, right? You're doing one at a time. Yeah. And that's yeah. the only problem about our industry. Because I've asked today, what would you tell somebody who's getting in your industry? Don't. Yeah. Right. We lost 100,000 people in the last year. Well, there's no, I mean, if it's like here, there's there's very little inventory. It's yeah. everywhere. There's no inventory. Yeah. That's right. the problem. You can't and build a no house. One's, yeah. No one's building. At 8%, 9%, 10%. Now uh, rates are seven, six point six two five. Is that what it is now? Yeah. For, yeah. So rates have come down a lot. Yeah. Point in something, much, right? Much but they're still everybody still remembers the two and three percent. Oh yeah. How could you yeah. not, right? Those were the good old days. <laughs> right. But that those are an anomaly. We all thought we were dying. <laughs> everybody was still trying to get. do better. We we were dying. Everybody thought we were gonna die. Everybody's gonna be killed and you know. It was worse than the you know World War One. No, World War One. We lost sixty to seventy million people nation uh, throughout the world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You just uh, we, you didn't have the cameras there recording it at the time, so it all gets kind of glossed over, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. People can't. Can you? That's like that's a lot of people. Yeah. That's oh, all gosh. of California gone. That's you know, and Texas. It's, we can't imagine it. We were fortunately we missed it, but yeah, yeah. The, the longer it goes, the harder it is to to even conceive of that right and that's what people don't remember you got to remember the past so we don't relive it and that's unfortunate because nobody knew what inflation was right unless you had been around 42 years ago you were in yeah. 10 or whatever which that means you had to be 50 so the last right. election was one because nobody understood it now the next question is do you understand it and do you understand how it got here no i don't think so i mean you know once you start handing out trillions and trillions of dollars what do you think those dollars are going to be? Well, I mean, it's just basic common sense. You can't do that. Uh, you're going to destroy what everybody has, you know, people, but people don't understand that. And that all goes back to what you're trying to teach and goes back to, we need to, So I know what you're doing and you're helping everybody, but you may, we need to get to the schools. We need to teach it earlier. Also. I couldn't agree more. I, I don't understand why it's not being taught unless they would just rather have people that don't understand because they overspend you know, and it's great for if you're a corporation and you're selling things or you're trying to market things to kids that don't understand money. I mean, it's it's great, but I guess it's up to everybody to learn that themselves. But when you look back on some of the things they taught you in high school, we had plenty of room in that curriculum for some financial literacy. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had yeah, well, they actually had it with home ec if you took it, but <laughs> I don't want to learn how to sew. Um, <laughs> you know, balance the checkbook, all, all the stuff they're like, balance a checkbook. I don't even yeah. do that now. Why would I want to do that? No, nah, yeah. you don't need to anymore. But well, you just uh, see as long as you are smart with numbers and understand where everything is, you can use it, you know, computer stuff and or I know where my numbers are because I'm a numbers guy. So. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. I run them, you know, every month, see where we're at. Uh it's not that hard. But you know, uh my problem is that you're looking at the United States in general, and less than half have any savings at all. I mean, and it really doesn't matter how much money you make. I mean, of course, people making the big money they save more. They're usually no, they pretty don't. 
Well, minimum. not all of them, but you they know, spend more. And then when you figure you have an emergency, you don't have an emergency fund and you have an emergency. Well, where are you going to get the money? You know, you got to car fix your car, or buy a furnace or you're, you're going to use a credit card. It, I don't even want to know what those rates are. 20, 25 to 29 now. That's, I mean, that's insane. That's loan shark stuff, you know? And so now you're going down this path of how do I make that minimum payment? And they just mushrooms. Uh, so it's all about discipline. You know, it's easy to say and it's hard to do, but it, it, it's easy to say, oh, I'll save 10%, 20%. I'm going to put it in the tax-free mutual fund, but it, it's hard to do that for a lot of people, you know? Um, but when you see it working, it's, uh, it's when you see somebody who's done it, then it becomes easier. Right. But people these days, and it's been this way, we look for instant gratification. We don't, we, it's hard for us to see long-term how that's going to affect us and how it's really going to help us. And that's one of the things that people need to understand, but we're so focused right now with everything that's going on. We don't see, look long-term. No, you're exactly right. That's exactly the situation is everybody's looking at what they can do today. And Hey, I, I worked hard today. I earned this. I deserve this. You know, if you go to most financial planners and say, I need a, some help, they'll say, well, how much money are you spending at Starbucks? Let's start there. You know, $50 a month at Starbucks, $100 a month. At Star what are you spending? I mean, if you quit that's, going to Starbucks. That's two weeks for most people. We're talking about a month. <laughs> I gave all that up. I bought a thing at home and, you know, I make coffee better than anybody. So yeah, Same here. Absolutely. I'm not yeah. paying $8 for a cup of coffee, but that's where it starts is this privilege, you know, well, I want it my way and I get whatever I want because I work hard for it. You know, you got to get out of that mindset. And also our, we put that into our kids, right? We wanted them to have a better life than we did and we messed them up. No doubt about There's it. There's no friction. I heard this the other day. I was talking about, I was on one of the um, Huberman labs. This is a guy. He's out of Stanford. He's a doctor. He talks about all this stuff, has a podcast. He's been on Rogan a few times. And uh, he was talking with another guy. They were talking about the body and friction and how this happens. And he's like, this is the same problem what we did to our kids by not you know, and, and wealthy people do their, unfortunately, bad things to their kids by them not having any friction at all to learn and grow and become different people. And that's, we can't do that to your kids anymore. Right. right. It's, it's not right. And that's the difference. I totally agree. I mean, when we, I know you're, you're younger than me, I'm sure. But, you know, when we grew up, you earned everything you wanted. You know, you might get something for Christmas that you wanted, but I, anything outside of the clothes and the I mean, it was basically, well, how are you going to earn the money? I mean, you know, I started working 15 to deliver papers and, you know, I worked at Arthur Treacher's frying fish and whatever I could find, you know, two, three dollars an hour, because that's just how it was. There wasn't going to be anybody handing you any money. No, my dad died of Harris leukemia when I was 12. So we moved from the middle class side of town to the low, the dirt road port, basically. And, and so if I needed anything, I had to get, I had to earn it. And there, I was, I was telling everybody, I was like, you don't understand. I had. I think I had two, maybe three pair, three shirts and a pair of jeans and one pair of tennis shoes. And they were fucking falling apart, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, where are you going to get it? There's nobody there to get it. It's, it's a different life. Yeah. Uh, especially when you've seen it. Yeah. So, you know, and that's why I still have all this clothes in my, in my closet because I'm a clothes hoard now, even though I don't wear, all I wear is black t-shirts and <laughs> all right. you, got, yeah. you got a lot of making up to do. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that's all I have. I mean, it's like I see all this stuff. It's like unless I'm on stage or whatever, which it hasn't been for a little bit because I took this. I took the last year off. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm focused on business because this whole thing destroyed my business. How do I get out of this? And I do a lot of podcasts and I enjoy that. But, you know, it, it's getting better. And like everything, just time heals all and you just keep going. Yeah. I mean, you got to refocus every once in a while and, and you, it's easy to get off track. We did it. I mean, when we first started, it took us a long time to figure out, you know, who's finding value in our offering. It, it really did. We probably took three or four years before we knew this is the direction this company needs to go. And when it did, we rebranded the whole thing and just now we're just lockers. You know, we were trying to sell everything and we realized, well, we're making all our money doing this. Why don't we just focus on this? And that's really what made all the difference. Uh, Knowing your customer. hundred percent. And, and that's and what Gabe, no, Gary that's Gary the biggest thing businesses don't do is. Who is your customer? I enter, I was on another podcast earlier that I do, and a lady was talking about her her client is Tracy, who is a 33-year-old female who has two kids, drives a Tahoe. I mean, she they knew her perfect <laughs> client to the T, and that's what you need to do. 
No, you really nice. do. You guys sell lockers. So your perfect thing is who buys the lockers and what type of, you know, and not selling everything under the sun, just like myself, niching more and more what I do down to veterans, business owners, and um, reverse mortgages to help them get their dignity back. That's the three things I focus on. Yeah. I mean, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, we, and I would we, love just to focus on VA, the veterans. There's just yeah. not enough in my area. And Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I could do all of California, but then the problem is, it's we're all so much about going saying local to fight off all these horrible online companies that take advantage of veterans and everybody else so. that act like they're serving the veteran. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. Now, do you run into a lot of veterans who don't know what the VA can do for them as far as first time home ownership? They just don't well, know. The, they they the kind of know, but they don't really know. Yeah. They don't yeah. know everything. They don't understand everything. So I'm putting the, so my next, so my first book was financial freedom, building personal wealth through home ownership. And it was for everybody. My next one is just a veterans edition of it. That's only for veterans. And it's going to basically break down the, the program, change a little bit. I mean, the overall book will work. I just have to change one of the chapters instead of all the loan programs. It's just talking about the new VA loan program that came out two years ago. Yeah, when I was doing research for the class, that that one blew me away was how good a deal you can get oh, yeah. as a veteran. I mean, it's unbelievable. And to not take advantage of that is is crazy. Because people, and it's really the older people who didn't take advantage of it because they're like, I'm going to leave it for the next guy. It's not going anywhere. It's right. for you, right? right. And, and prior to the Blue Water Act one, that was two years in January, two years ago, it was okay. Back in the 80s and 90s, even in the early 2000, it was not good. It was not enough. It was it was based off of a small amount, and it was it was by county. With the Blue Water Act, they got rid of the county part. It's the same for everybody across the board. They go off the conforming loan limit for the normal, and then above that is the jumbo. And you can go up to 2.5 million with no money down. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. most most places though. It's like I won't go above 1.5. That's plenty. It should be, right? I mean, it's, oh, it's a yeah. first time buyer, all right? I mean, what, yeah. Yeah. well, the problem was the old program was by county. So you could have two counties right next to each other and split by the street. That side of the street was 700,000. This side of the street's 450,000. That makes no sense. Max for a VA. Yeah. So that's, but that's how it was based by county. And, you know, same with uh, FHA is based off of county. Yeah. That's a good thing to do because I've met a couple guys that we were teaching that they had no idea what, what was out there for them. And it's like, you just got to ask for this stuff and, and it's yours. I mean, you earned it. You, you, yeah. you sacrificed. You, this is and go to, uh, for you guys, that, whoever you're helping, tell go find a broker in your area like myself that only works as a broker because that's the most inexpensive way to get your loan. Is it? Yeah, I will oh, definitely yeah. do that. Find somebody. Because I, I deal a lot with a company called UWM, which is wholesale only. They're the largest lender in the nation now, and they only go through people like me. Is that right? Independent. Huh? You're an independent broker? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That means I can, I use only wholesale lenders, but the most of the lenders that I use are wholesale. They don't have retail at all. I don't, they don't fight that. against me. Right. There's another one that starts with the R and, and they used to be with a Q and they, they say they're amazing, but they, they, they want us to give us all, give all our stuff to them. And then they'll never give us our client back. They happens still, in the locker business, believe it or not. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. Every and so business. for us, UWM and there was Home Point Financial that's not here anymore. They were somebody else. But there's so many different companies that are wholesale. They're like, here's your client back. Your client just called for this here. Call them and, you know, they help their their partners and how it should be. If, if you don't have that trust, you can't have a relationship, right? I mean, there's yeah. no way you're sending your and, client in and, there. And veterans are, the thing about veterans, we are trusting individuals. Yeah, and I'm so sure. we think when people say they're going to do what they say they're going to do, they're going to do what they say they're going to do. And yeah. nine times out of 10, they don't. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Yeah. Well, I'll just, they're lucky to have you in their corner then. And I will try to find somebody here that does a similar work. I'm sure there is somebody. Well, say, or send me exactly where you are. I can I can put it through my the UWM. I can find them for you. Okay. Well, I'm in Charlotte. Yeah. Most of our classes are in Charlotte. So, okay. yeah. That'd but be I great. mean, like I said, I'm, I see the books behind me up there on the shelf. Yeah, I have a yeah. I mean, the whole purpose is getting them out to everybody. I yeah. don't need people. I don't need you. Don't make money by selling them through Amazon. So oh no, oh no, no, no. I learned that too. Uh, we did a children's book, my wife and I, for the pandemic. Uh, and I learned, man, you selling a book if no, if you don't have a publisher or you don't have a hundred thousand followers uh, on LinkedIn, forget it. I mean, you won't get a publisher to start with, and it's such a competitive field. 
but I give away, you know, hundreds of books. It's, yeah. it's my, my goal in it is not to sell books. It's to make people maybe give somebody a second chance by reading that, you know, I went into this system, prison system thinking these guys were all dangerous. They look dangerous and they were going to hurt me to on the other end, realizing these are people just like me. They just got caught when I didn't. And I would be in that same situation. I'm no different. And, and frankly, most people aren't, we've all made mistakes. The prison system makes you pay dearly for them. And then you're marked for life, you know? So right. it's, it's but just there are some thing. bad guys in there. Oh yeah. Well, I'm minimum security. So yeah, well, I'm just, I, I, we have Stan <laughs> Quentin yeah. close to us. Right. And they're trying oh. to get the governor's trying to rework the program to get the guards be, to be nicer. Excuse me. It's no, fucking San so. Quentin. <laughs> How about this? We're going to put you in there in a uniform, Mr. Governor, by yourself yeah. <laughs> with a couple other people and you tell these guards how to get all these people how to move and we'll see what how you feel about it afterwards perfect yeah spend an hour in there i'd love to walk see a it. mile in somebody else's shoes before you can tell them yeah. what to do exactly yeah get to know the business before you start making the rules uh, that would be nice yeah uh the other thing about minimum security is you start out you go into the toughest place they got and you work your way through years and years and years and years of good behavior to minimum security. So any infraction puts you right back to number starting point, the bad prison. And I, I really think I never saw any disagreement in there at all. Maybe some a conversation that got a little heated, but as far as like anybody touching each other aggressively, never, they would never do that. Uh, it's any infraction and they're looking for them. So, you know, it, you couldn't be in a safer place. I mean, you're surrounded by guys that would never do anything to get in trouble uh, yep. for the most part, but I have maximum a security is hold, totally different, totally yeah. different story. I have a veteran who is, he was in prison. So he was in the Marine for 10 years, got out, got incarcerated for 23 years, created a program to help veterans not re to not come back in. Cause he's like, his big thing is you train where you train us to be a tool. He said, it's like bringing a Bradley paint it yellow and then saying it's a school bus. It's out there ripping up the streets because it doesn't know any differently because it's a Bradley. It's not a school bus just because you painted it at school and, and said school bus on it doesn't make it that he goes. The problem is we get out and we are tools of war and we're not we need a boot camp out to deal with this. And he says the problem is a lot of the PTSD either commit suicide or you go to prison. And they're yeah. like, what? He goes, it's like going to being in prison is like dying. And so yeah. he created this program while he's in first prisoner ever to create a program that got funded by the governor and everything. And now that's what he does. And it's a, and they have put all the veterans in different regions together, like three different regions. It's because they used to have them all over the place. Now all veterans are in the same place. So oh, that's in, really in by like Southern California, Northern California and centrally located. And that he's working on the thing nationwide right now. So that's funny. I got to where I could, pretty much pick out the guys that had done military service in prison. You know, they, their clothes are a little cleaner. They walk a little straighter. They're very polite. You know, they're very, very well disciplined people and they're pretty easy to pick out. And, and you always felt like they should be not in with the rest of these guys, you know, cause they don't behave the same, you know, they, they well, it was, it was because of their PTSD that they did drugs or this or that, or, oh, yeah. you know, did, and that's what the problem is. They didn't get the help they needed. And that's our big push to help veterans. We're doing a fire walk in April, here locally it's for veterans to walk across fire we have the guy that used to do it for anthony robbins he we're going to put on a huge event and they're going to you know help him get out of their issues by walking across fire so oh that's great i'm all yeah. for it i'll tell you the guys that put forth the sacrifice and they got into some really bad spots i mean when you look at iraq afghanistan i mean are you kidding yeah. I, I can't imagine being a soldier in afghanistan to me that would just been absolute nightmare you can't it, shoot it, at anybody unless they shoot at you Okay, great. Idea. Well, not only that, just how we got out of there, you know, oh, the whole thing. Question. Now, most of these guys think, why the hell was I there? Yeah, you know? exactly. Now it all fell apart in what, 24 hours, 48 hours? Yeah. Well, I that's, mean, we won't get into the whole purpose <laughs> of why that happened. You know, we know uh, why that happened. Absolutely. Yeah. I just yeah. hope, I hope we're, we're moving forward as a country and we're not staying where we are. That's my, I don't care where we go, but we can't stay here. Well, we can't stay the with the same way and the same things going right now at all. Right. Period. No, I don't, I don't we can't, we can't spend any, we, the, the border is our biggest problem. We we have now a seven, there's amount of people came across the same would be what, the largest state in California. You're That's kidding. Many, I didn't know that. No. Yeah. Unbelievable. That's Unbelievable. how many people come across. We put them all together. They're the largest state in, in the United States. Unbelievable. And, and we don't know who they are. They, they're yeah. not coming back till third. And this is political, but I'm sorry, but the 30, 35 to their court dates. Give me a break. Unbelievable. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they're never coming back. 
Yeah. I mean, and that's sad because we, our sheriff here locally, he's like, I went to the border because he goes, I have CNN on one screen and I have uh, Fox news on the other. And usually in the middle is where it's at. Right. Right, The truth. Right. The truth. And he's (laughs) like, uh, Fox news had it even wrong. It was worse than that. Really? Yeah. I I, I don't doubt it. I can't imagine. It's got to be completely out of control. And And that was Arizona border. That's not California border because we already had, we already had gates up. Well, you know, seems like a pretty simple problem to solve if you want yeah, very to. easy yeah right i mean how hard could that be but it doesn't it's not a priority obviously well there it's a it's a they want the problems so they look at other things instead of dealing with what are what we really want to deal with look yeah. over here at the over here instead of looking over here yeah exactly exactly yeah. But this, I'm sorry, I took over your podcast. I apologize. I'm glad. No, I'm having to join the conversation and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I'm a little worried and I see it in business right now. We're suffering a little bit because there's so much uncertainty mm-hmm. uh, coming up. I mean, who knows which way we're going as a country? Uh, it's hard to, you know, make long-term plans. And and who knows with interest rates, like you say, they're going to, they keep moving around the interest rates a little bit. They're starting. Yeah. But the, I'm not worried about the Fed because we're even though what happened was, is when we spend you know, it's like being on a budget. You, you probably teach budgeting and sure. right. Every, everybody in the family or everybody in the business has to be on the budget. Well, if you have mom on the budget, but dad's not on the budget, it doesn't work. So fed is the mom and dad is president. They're not <laughs> in the same fucking place. Right. That's the problem. Right. No, this, Fed's trying right. to stop it. And the, and he's like, Oh, let's go spend another, t- you know, $17 trillion. What the hell? Yeah. It's Still crazy. It. Yeah. yeah, I don't even think they print it anymore. They just send it off electronically. I don't even yeah. think there is paper backing it up. Well, it's yeah, well, and you, you don't even know about the CIA, CIA presses. Right. Or, oh, there's a lot we don't know. That's for yeah. sure. But you, they print a lot of money in many departments for whatever they need. So. Yeah, I don't think there's any stopping it. You know, there's no safeguard. Yeah, no. It's, and it's very dangerous. Yeah, and, and that's the whole, you know, we're, we just need to get back to more. I liked Reagan myself. He was funny as shit. I didn't realize how funny it was because I was a young kid. So yeah. I started listening to his stuff. You're like, man, he is funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Reagan was great. Well, he was the GE pitch man for years. He knew how to sell. He knew how to get you going, man. He'd pull up those graphs with the tanks on them and say, the Russians got this many tanks. We only got this many tanks. You know, real simple, real basic. Anybody could get it. And he came in and, you know, at a time when the country was really in turmoil. We're um, there now. Yeah, and we're there, and I keep wondering who's who's coming next. Uh, we'll see. You know, I don't know. Um, we can talk after this. Yeah, uh, right. tell you a couple more things. <laughs> All right, John McLaughlin, thank you so much for being on here. How do people oh, find pleasure. you? How do you need people to get involved? Do you need people to get involved or to find you? Oh, sure. Uh, if you go to lifeline to a soul dot com, we've got a place you could leave your email address. Uh, mention Ed Show. I'll be happy to send you an autographed book. Uh, won't cost you anything. Just want you to read about my experience and what I learned. And uh, it was quite a quite a ride. Changed my life. You know, uh, you realize there's some people that just need a little help to change the trajectory of their life. And it's it's time and money well spent. So I totally agree. I have a friend of mine, Steve Sims, who does a thing in Kern County. He goes in and helps them. These people come up with businesses and then they have, take a group of entre- entrepreneurs in there to vote on the person and see who wins. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. It's a unique idea. So yeah, if you've done it, if you've run your own company, then you you know that's where you want to be. I mean, that's how you want to spend your life. Working for somebody else is a it's it's a different experience altogether. You know, so however you can get there, get there. Well, what people think is working for somebody else, there's security. There's no yeah. security working for somebody else. At you all. only have security for yourself. Because even with me going through what we just went through, my wife's like, well, do you want to? I'm like, yeah, I'll do my resume. I'll, so I hired a company to you know, do my resume and do everything. And Because I hadn't had a resume done for myself for 30 years, right? Because I've never needed one. But I actually need them when I do my broker approvals. They want a resume. So now I have a really nice resume for that. Oh, that's the one yeah. I created. But it's like you don't understand how um, the working for other people, there's a lot of jobs out there, but no one's hiring yeah. They're hiring the lower end stuff, but they're not hiring the middle stuff that the, most people think that all the jobs are. And um, they say there's a lot of jobs opening. I don't think there really is that many job openings. I think that's just jobs that they created and put out there, but are not going to ever hire. It's hard. i tell you what, it's hard. I tried to, took me seven years just to get a teaching job because I'm in my fifties. You know, nobody wants to hire somebody past the age of probably 30, 35, because they're, they're, they're setting your ways. You know, the insurance is going to be high. There's a million reasons not to do that uh but i agree it's very difficult to get a high paying job 
Well, right now they're hiring more older people than newer, younger people. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I just heard a whole survey. I guess the young people don't show up or don't know what to do, but the older <laughs> people know exactly what to do. So they're hiring them more than anybody else. But, you know, again, you got to be okay with the what, you know, what are you looking for? Right. And they can't even ask you your age. And what they do now because of your resume, they only put 15 years of employment on there. That's it. Yeah. They won't let you do more than that because then people, oh. will, then it becomes age discrimination. They can figure out how old you are. Yeah. I didn't yeah, know and that. They don't hire you. Age discrimination. Who makes these rules up? That's crazy. It's <laughs> it's just the, you know, I don't want to say woke environment, but it's just the, oh, a kinder, gentler, whatever. You know what? I I, yeah. I prefer friction. A I little bit. Wanna, be okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, if I'd you don't want to be... hire me because you think I'm older, well, guess what? I don't care. I'm not <laughs> looking to retire at your place. <laughs> right. right. Oh, I know. I, I'm all for being up front, you know? Yeah. Uh, Cause you you know, out, I mean, I was like, I saw a Spotify job, which was like, man, cause I do all the podcasts and I'm like, and I really enjoy this. I'm like, that'd be cool. You know I mean? That's what all started the whole thing. Well, why don't you try it? Cause I've been talking to a few people who just put in for jobs that they got and they couldn't believe it. Well, I can't work for somebody else. I'm a, I'm a not grumpy old vet. So I couldn't either. Not for long. I mean, uh, that teaching job was great cause it was in a prison and I was the only one there watching me, you know, there was people because I was hired by the college the local community college, they, they weren't sending anybody in to watch me. So it was great. It was like running my own company. But once you get a taste of working for yourself, it would be very, very hard to go back. Yeah. I, I can't much. imagine, you know, saying, okay, I'll do it your way, not my way. That'd be hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's kind of stupid. What? You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it would take. That's all it would take. One all time. Right. All right, John. It was nice having you on internet. Inter Edison. I really appreciate it. Go check out his book. That was Lifeline Soul. Lifeline to a soul. Yes, sir. Lifeline to a soul. Right. Dot com. Yep. Yep. Okay. Put your name down. I'll be happy to send you a book. And thank you so much for having me on it. I really enjoyed it. Oh, me too. And uh, don't go anywhere. Stay right there. All right, everybody. Thank okay. you so much for being here. And we'll talk to you next week.